Demolition, you're, you're with Jean-Marc Vallée, obviously you did Dallas Buyers Club. What, tell me about the movie and, and why you were attracted to this one in particular. Well, Jean-Marc Vallée, first off, I had heard and read about his process and how he films his movies and how he treats his actors and you know just his, his whole way of going about the sort of, or sort of, I guess, circumventing the whole kind of Hollywood vanity style of filmmaking. Um, and uh, I loved it. I mean, I loved, I loved hearing about it. And then when I got to set, it was about no makeup. You know, there's no, there's no lighting. Um, you know, he's constantly moving in for a, a close-up. And then the next take, he's running across the street and getting a wide shot and then coming back for a close-up again. Then, mm, then I don't like that angle. I'm going for a two-shot now. And so there was really, there's really no rhyme or reason to the way in which he creates it's just about instinct and I try and do the same thing take to take and in my process too and to see somebody who is at the helm of everything has such a cumbersome crew and who's able to kind of follow that that was one of the reasons and then the other thing was that I I read the script and I, I opened it up and I thought oh I know exactly where this is going and where, where did you think it was going I just thought okay I've seen this before I've seen the the first scene where you know, talking and talking, and then something sort of disastrous happens, and then here we go on a journey where the guy's going to come to some realization. And it's very much about, Davis Mitchell is the character, and it's, it's very much about grief. I don't think I'm giving anything away to say he loses his wife. Yeah. And um, so you saw, you saw that in the beginning. Where, where, where would you think a movie like that would obviously go? Well, I mean, it's funny because I did this movie Southpaw right before and at the, the first act of the movie, my wife dies in that movie and then I was reading the script and I went, oh man, you know, I don't know if I, I, I just came to it with my own prejudices because I was already going to make Southpaw and I thought, oh man, I, I don't know if I can handle both of those things. So, but then I also felt like, okay, here's a story about loss and it's a tough subject and I thought, is Jean-Marc Vallée um, we're probably going to be moving into territory that's emotionally pretty devastating. I really wanted to want to do it, you know, but uh, I didn't know as I was reading it. And I just thought, okay, here we go. We have this scene. And then, and then all of a sudden, the scene with the vending machine came up. And I thought, what is going on? What is this? And then I thought, now he's writing letter? <laughs> what is this? You know? He starts writing letters to the vending machine company. Yeah. And completely pouring out his soul yeah. to the customer service people at the vending machine company, <laughs> yeah. all because a pack of M&Ms did not you know, fall out when it should have. And I thought, we're living in a time where email is everything, where this exchange is like, it's always like that, and there's, it's really impersonal, and he's writing these, he's handwriting these letters in this really weird way, and I thought, what, what, what is this? So then I thought, okay, this is just cute, you know, maybe, and then all of a sudden, it just starts to turn, and this guy starts to do most interesting, awkward, oddest things. And it was really more his actions than it was the way he was feeling or emoting that became what was so interesting. And I thought, whoa, then he meets this woman and then you expect romance and there's not romance and you meet this kid who, you, who comes out to him and then you think, uh-oh, now that's gonna happen because there's scenes in the scripture it feels like they're getting very physically close and maybe the kid's gonna try and do, that doesn't happen. They become best friends. You're you always know? on edge. Always, and so and, and also when the kid comes out to him, Davis, your character, gives him terrible advice. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> you like, think so? Yes, almost in a, in a heart. Yes, because he's like, just pretend you like girls until you're out of school. <laughs> I and mean, they go it's kind of true, and then right? Move to San Francisco. <laughs> it was very honest advice, but it's not the kind yeah, of advice you really. would usually see in a movie, right? <laughs> yes, it is. It's true. It's not like. But I mean, it's really. He doesn't give him a speech about be yourself, it's great. He's like, oh, you're going to be tortured. But he also has no judgment about it. Right. You know, he also goes like, okay, that's where you are. Well, the limited knowledge of that that I can give you is like, move to San Francisco. And like, <laughs> if you don't right. like that, you can maybe move to a warmer But everything place. was a surprise. You're right. Everything about that relationship was a surprise, yeah. which I loved. And even like these crazy scenes, you know, you start getting deeper into the movie and you just, these crazy things are happening and you go, what is how what are, where are we going how are we going to end this what's going on and then all of a sudden it just starts to ebb and and flow into this ending where that is so subtle that is not about this massive catharsis it's not about this like epiphany that 
that the character has and finally realizes something. He just realizes that there was love. Yeah. And, and that's all he needed. Yeah. Ultimately. Yeah. And it's the beginning of that that journey that we thought we were going to go on, uh, which is the end of the movie. There is a there is a scene where the you in one of the crazier moments, and you really don't know what's going to happen here. You encourage the kid to point a gun at you. Yes. That's got to be, I, I don't care that you know that there's safety people on the set and the gun is not loaded and all, that, that has to be one of the weirdest things to film. Yes. I think the movie exists in that odd space. Um, and in terms of filming it, yeah. Like I, I am not a, I'm not a huge fan of, you know, guns and I and I know the dangers of them. I've spent a lot of time shooting live ammunition and dealing with guns and uh, not just on movie just, sets. Just, just in your life all the time. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> in preparation, I learned, you know, I played a police officer in Rome. We spent five months and we, 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 we trained with all live ammunition, you know, so and and learned a lot from police officers and from the military and I've played a number of roles in the military but also really shot a lot of live, you know, many, many, many thousands of rounds of live ammunition. And so I, I have been taught by the best people in the world how to handle that. So I have a, also have a, my own sense of safety, even with the things that are, I know are safe, you know, um, and you hear the stories and things like that. So yeah, it was scary, but it was also very But also safe. a kid was holding it. <laughs> yeah, and if you see the scene too, there's like, there's a, there's a, the ending to the scene, which is like yeah. particularly, it's kind of hilarious and terrifying at the same time. It turns out to, you know, it becomes hilarious because you're so terrified yeah. part of it, right? You yeah. really, you don't, that's what I loved about the movie, that you are right, there was nothing predictable. Um, you have had, I, I, to say it's a varied career, a diverse career comes up a lot, but it really is one of the more, diverse careers, particularly of someone who's your age. And I know you get asked this a lot, but I am really curious, when you're looking at a script, how do you know that that's a movie that you want to do? Um, because you must get everything from, you know, <laughs> well, no, I mean, it's, yeah. you know, comic Different book choices, movies yeah. to incredibly obtuse indie films, and you kind of balance them all. Well, one thing I learned is that you have to know what you believe in and you also have to know what you're good at. Um, and there are things that I wish I were good at or that I, and that I may not be and I'm not, you know? And, and I think it's just learning like the boundaries. Um, but the way I choose is I never, I, I'm always looking for an unconscious journey. Not, not like the obvious conscious one. I'm always looking for something where I can infuse um, history and behavior and that has the depth to it that I can always draw on. Like I, it's very hard for me to, to exist in a world that's totally fictional, you know, where mm -hmm. things are sort of just, I, I have a sense of humor, but with it, that sense of humor, it has to exist somewhere in a bit of darkness. I guess that's the best way I can. Because you're such a dark it. human being. Yeah, because I'm super dark. <laughs> <laughs> because after I leave here, I'm going back to my cage in a dark, dark <laughs> that's room. That's what I thought. Yeah. Um, I, I, you know, yeah, I walk around the streets blindfolded because I'm so dark. Um, no, I just like, I, I just felt like I remember when I was a kid and there are all these high school movies being made. It was like the the decade of these particular type of high school movies being like made. Like which which ones? Like Ten Things I Hate About You right. and um, American Pie, right? right. The, and because uh, I was thinking Sixteen Candles. Oh no, wait. That oh was right, my that high generation. School. Yeah, I, that I know that too. But <laughs> I wasn't able to be in those movies at the time. No, you no. weren't born. Jay. You can say. <laughs> yes, it. I was born. I was born. <laughs> but I. But I. But American Pie. That was big when you were when you were a kid. Well, I wasn't a kid. Well, old, I mean, I was like you were yeah. old enough to see it. Yeah. So I, but when I was auditioning at a young age, I was always like, "What is? What are these movies about?" Like, my high school experience wasn't like this at all. And then Donnie Darko came up, and I was like, "Oh, this feels like my high school experience." <laughs> <laughs> so if that gives you any insight into who who I am and how I pick roles, then I hope it does. <laughs> Do, Donnie Darko was a big moment for you. You were twenty. 
when it was yeah, when you made 20, it yeah I think t maybe 21 when it came out but that was is that the movie that sort of more than anything else kind of defined your taste in movies the did it kind of signal to you you know in a perfect world this is the kind of movie I'm gonna make all the time it's uh, it's funny to do that like that and this movie October Sky <laughs> it's like right these two, I was super young when I made October Sky I was 16 years old and then also Donnie Darko it's sort of those are different sides of me, you know. It's October Sky, very optimistic. Yeah, I I believe in hope. I I I, I believe in uh, love. I do, but I believe that uh, y you know the human mind is really complicated. So yeah, I mean I think Donnie Darko, to me is one of my favorite movies I've made and one I'm most proud of because uh, it it does sort of define not the way I look at the world literally, but. Um, there are a lot of things in there that I believe about the world. Yeah. What is some? What is, what is one element of that movie that really one scene, one aspect of it that really resonated with you that you thought was just incredibly cool and still think it's incredibly cool? I think the sequence where he, in my character, meets um, the the bunny rabbit, you know, Frank. Uh, that cute, that cute little that bunny sweet, rabbit. That sweet, sweet bunny rabbit. Yeah. <laughs> I like what you call it full a bunny hope, rabbit. Full of yeah. hope and joy. Yeah. Um, when I when I when I meet him, I think that that scene. I just remember when we first shot it, like on a golf course and stuff. You know, it's just movies are so amazing, and being an actor in them, and even being on stage is so amazing because you you really never know how people are going to respond to those things. And these are things that when we were doing them, they were important to us, but we never knew would have the resonance that they have. So or that they've they've had, and so that. That, that scene in particular. And also I remember as an actor making a choice in that scene as to how I talked to the rabbit. Um, you know, that wasn't really scripted and it was the beginning where, where I said, well, I'm just gonna throw this to see if it sticks, you know? Yeah. And all of a sudden I sort of started looking at the rabbit, my sort of chin down, looking at him in a particular way. I think because of the angle of where the camera was in the close up and then eventually became you know, a choice that my character made every time he saw the rabbit, sort of how he started to talk to him. And it's those little things that I've learned to trust over time, those little weird instinctual things character-wise that I go, oh, why is that showing? Oh, I'm going to use that, you know. Um, and that was the beginning of it. So that's why I love that scene the most. Your parents are both artists. Your mom's a writer. Your dad's a director. Um, what, what, what was it like? Growing up in the house, I mean, was it? Did you did you did you talk about art a lot? Did you did you ever watch crappy television together? Did you did they always take you to see art movies and go to museums? Like, what was <laughs> what was the what was the pop culture upbringing like in your house? Oh man, I mean, you know, well, first of all, it depends on what you consider pop culture, but like, I mean, and. I don't consider it a crappy TV show, but Beverly Hills 90210 was like, I remember seeing the first season with my mm -hmm. sister and staying up late, you know? I remember, uh, I mean, my parents um, did this weird thing where they, my dad would tape stuff on VHS off the TV, uh -huh. and then he would like, it would run out, and so we'd see like the first, no, like eight tenths of almost every movie and never know the end. <laughs> That's incredibly is, frustrating. Well, it's obviously informed most of my movie choices. If you can tell, like, the ending is always unresolved, you know? I'm like, I'm never up for a resolved ending. Yeah, I grew but, up not wanting endings to anything. Yeah, understandably. <laughs> That's hilarious. Understandably, yeah. Did yeah. this drive Maggie crazy? Um, yeah, both of us, the two of us. Like, it would fuzz out. Like, it would like go, oh, I remember watching this movie. I remember watching Pete's Dragon when I was a kid, and I yeah. just never know what happens at the end of Pete's Dragon. Wow. Like, there's this scene where Pete's by, like, a shack, and they're by a river and stuff, and, like, it was my favorite movie. I had a Pete's Dragon shirt, and, like, I still have no idea how that movie ends. The dragon dies a horrible death. What? A horrible, fiery death. Oh, my God. <laughs> Not That's really. That's, like, the beginning of no, almost no. every movie I do. <laughs> um, but, like, I, uh... With that, or like, I remember just every, so every movie was taped. My dad would tape it, and it would just, we'd never get to the <laughs> Why, end. Did he just not know how to tape movies? No, I just like VHS, <laughs> I guess you, he'd just do it, record it, and he'd be like, ah, the kids will just like, they'll be into it. We'll just rewind it anyway and watch it a hundred times. So he was smart like that. But uh, yeah. Do you remember, do you remember auditioning and getting the part for City Slickers, which was the very first thing? I do. I, I, I totally remember. Um, I remember auditioning first in Los Angeles, 
And then I remember Ron Underwood, the director, asking me to come out to New Mexico, or is it Colorado? No, New Mexico, where they were shooting before they filmed the ending things, which were going to be the was going to be the beginning of the movie. They were going to come back to LA, but they were shooting all the cattle drives. And my dad and I flew out. To, oh, it was Montana. I think my dad and I flew out to Billings, Montana. I think, um, and we were in a hotel room. We stayed stayed there two nights, and and I went in. And I read, and then when before we left, I got the call that I got in the part. So uh, I definitely remember that, and I remember being on set. And I remember pretty much everything from that experience, which is pretty interesting. There's a lot from my childhood that I don't remember, and I remember everything from that. You sort of found your place. Like, you knew at that moment that you wanted to be an actor and on a movie set. I thought I did. I'm still trying to figure it out. But I, <laughs> I, I definitely, like, I thought I did. I thought there were, there, it, was, it was an interesting, very complicated time. I mean, when you ask a kid, an actor who's a kid, you know, why they get into it, I think it's, it's filled with a lot of very interesting and very complicated reasons. Um, at least now looking back on it. But... Uh, I did have something about it. There was something there that I, regardless of the sort of um, exciting, shiny quality of the whole thing and it being seemed like foreign to me, I think there was something about being able to express it and feeling comfortable expressing myself that was just always there and I always loved. And you kept, you wanted to do a lot. Your, your parents actually pulled you back a little bit. I mean, you went on a lot of auditions, but they didn't always say yes. Yeah. Uh, when you wanted to, when you got a part. Yeah, they never did actually. I mean, they allowed me to audition, but because they sort of understood the movie business from a different standpoint, they just felt like it was no place for a kid to be, you know, working. And they also believed deeply in an education. You know, my parents were working as hard as they could to pay for an education, because you know my mom came from two doctors. She's a child of two doctors, and my dad. Um, you know, grew up in a town where the arts were incredibly important, but education was really emphasized. So both of them were mad about making sure that I stayed in school and, and were until I decided myself and was of the age I could decide for myself that I, that I didn't want to continue that. But I went to college and I did two years of college, but that was always something. And I thank them to this day because I would have had nothing to compare any of this material that I I'm supposedly choosing or someone's asking me to do too. Had know? you not grown up in a in a real life? Well, not only a real life, I mean just an education. I mean just yeah. reading the great books, reading um, the masters of language, you know, being able to understand what is actually a great piece of work so that if I read something now, I can compare it and say this is interesting to me because somewhere deep in my mind I've I've been I've learned that stuff and that is a privilege. And my parents, at a young age, you don't realize what a privilege that is until you, you grow up and look for a job or try and get a job or whatever it is, and they knew it at that time. So um, they just would say, go and audition. You can go and audition. But um, when I would land a part that might take me out of school for two, three, four months, which is, they believed, a really formative time in a kid's mind and uh, their life, like they just say no. Was there a lot of um, was there a lot of inner turmoil, or or did you upset them when you when you left Columbia to go? I think you 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 left to go October to do October Sky. I did October Sky the second semester of my senior year of high school. I had already gotten into okay. college. I applied early, um, and I got in early acceptance, and so my second semester was free. And the time when all the seniors kind of go often have fun when they've gotten into uh. college already. <laughs> um, I went and I, I, I got a role in a movie and I made a movie, which was, which was really, honestly, admittedly, very strange. <laughs> <laughs> um, pretty cool, but also not what I expected. And how tough was that decision, though, to leave Columbia to go make, to go, I, I don't know if you got a job or why, why did you yeah. leave Columbia at that time? I left because uh, actually I was cast in Donnie Darko uh, and I had been auditioning for a number of things throughout, throughout my freshman and sophomore year. I mean, I, I think I had decided that I was feeling this pull of joy, like this pull of all these opportunities and joy. And when I weigh that and when you have the opportunity to weigh that, when, 
when someone says, hey, you can go work and it can be fun, or you can go work and you can do, I was like, it's time, you know? It just felt right to me. 2005, it was interesting because it was Jarhead, there was Proof, uh, Brokeback Mountain. It, yeah. it was it was really the year where you you became a man, Jake Gyllenhaal. Really? <laughs> it seems that I, way. I'm still waiting for that year, but yeah, sure, <laughs> absolutely. If you did, say so. <laughs> it did seem to be a big it did seem to be a big crossover year, and I wanted to ask you what that the experience on Jarhead particularly mm -hmm. must have been really something else. I mean that was that was a that was a kind of movie set, and it was also kind of a world that was so radically different than anything you had experienced. Yeah, absolutely. And you were paying a real person. Yeah. Those things, they, I mean, they just never leave you. It's funny, I was just talking to David Gordon Green. I'm about to make a movie with him in the next few weeks. And I was saying, we were talking about rehearsal, and I, and I referenced Sam Mendes when we were doing Jarhead. And I said, you know, when we did Jarhead, Sam would rehearse every single scene. He'd bring the actors in. We'd rehearse every scene, even if it was a, an eighth of a page, for an hour. So. Wow for essentially almost like 90 hours. Do you find that theater, directors who come from the theater do that more? I mean, yes and no, but yeah. I mean, there's such a tremendous respect for discovery in rehearsal. Yeah. That, I mean, you just find so much in there that I'm sure as a director, I mean, as an actor, rehearsal is everything to me. It's the time you can really find those little idiosyncrasies that you, you think you'll find when you're on set, but you won't find and you think you can find when you're on your own, but you don't really find until you put into practice. You know, or, uh, you know, there are these, I think the military in, in, in particular, you know, I grew up, what I didn't even know really was my grandfather, my grandfather was in the military, but, you know, and I have a number of friends who've been in the military, my close friends, and who are Marines, but, um, and I, I think uh, my work ethic came from my grandfather my mother's side, who is a doctor, up at 4 a.m. every morning, surgeon, you know, son of immigrants. Um, his father, my great grandfather, was a tailor. And then also on my dad's side, you know, my grandfather was like in the military, very mm. hardworking, emphasized super hard work. But I think my mother and my father grew up in a certain era where there was this prejudice against the military. So walking into uh, play a Marine and to play a real person. Um, I just came in with my upbringing as I had been sort of, you know, my parents were like conscientious objectors <laughs> and all that stuff. And, um, and then it changed my life. Well, it must have completely changed your perspective on what Absolutely. soldiers go through. Well, and not only that, but just what it means, even if you're an actor and a lot of people can make fun about that and say, you know, you're just faking it, which you are. Like I have such a tremendous respect for the people that I learn from while I'm making yeah. a movie. I have taken so much from those experiences, um, and if only just a bit of it rubbed off of me, uh, you know, I, it, it, it changed my life, like that, that movie. And, uh, and then also, just the experience of it, I think, learning how to prepare and working with Sam, that was just a dream come true. I mean, that was, a, that was an excitement in my life that, and yeah, Jarhead or like Broke Back and um, Proof, you know, working in one year essentially with John Madden and Gwyneth Paltrow and Anthony Hopkins and Chris Cooper and Sam Mendes and Peter Sarsgaard, my now brother-in-law, right. um, and a whole slew of extraordinary, and Jamie Foxx, like incredibly talented people, and then Heath and Michelle and Ang Lee. I mean, I, I mean, that was just a year, that was just a magical year. You said that um, talking to Peter Sarsgaard, who you knew long before he became a relative, um, you actually, you, you've learned a lot about him, about acting. You've mm -hmm. talked to him a lot. Of, what, have you, what have you learned from him? You know, he is, I think he grew up in a particular way where I don't know if he's allowed to express himself mm -hmm. in the same way that I grew up. I was sort of always allowed to express myself. And so performance for him became, and being in front of a camera became a space within which he could be honest. And he wasn't afraid to be honest. And he really, really loved, loves and loved, when I first met him too, the kind of complicated, perverse but beautiful sides of all of us, you know? And a lot of that came from like, you know, him just saying, when you walk, he taught me really early on, when you walk on set, you have a lot of feelings already. You don't have to generate fake mm. feelings. 
you know? You don't necessarily have to picture something. They're all right there. Just give them some time and wait and they'll come up. And uh, when I was also pretty young, I worked with Dustin Hoffman. I remember Dustin saying to me, he was like, you know, you just have to be thinking something, you know? Don't like, you just standing there has enough history, you know? And tremendous confidence in the person you are and like not so much criticism, but just walking in and saying, okay, what do we got? You know, I have good stuff in me and I have rotten stuff in me and I'm down to show it as much as I can. And that's, that Peter just really just said from someone who's older than me, wiser than me, a better actor than me saying, do try this, try it out. And uh, I, I, I also misunderstood that for a while. Like I was like, oh, like if you're, in a bad mood, you should be in a bad mood, you know? I, not on set, but in the scene. Put it in there, you know? And, and uh, that's really brave. I mean, on Jarhead, I remember him, he was pretty pissed at me, just generally. Because <laughs> he was dating my sister, and we were working together, and we were like living together, and he was, and I, and um, I got into, we get this scene in the, in the movie where I put a gun, and this kid, Brian Garrity, played a, such a wonderful actor. Brian's not a kid, but I uh, pointed a gun in his face and we did it a lot. And at the time, Brian and I got in a pretty heated fight afterwards because there was a lot of reality in the movie. Yeah. And we went pretty far in that scene. And, you know, he's a victim in that scene and he was, he was pretty upset with me. And so Sam rewrote some stuff to have me apologize to Brian's character in the movie because of the situation. It was never written that way. Mm. And he asked Peter to be the one who told me because he was sort of my superior and he was also, you know, just based on behavior, really my superior too. And in the scene, Peter just came up to me with all the feelings we had with each other and he just, he came at me and he just came out with me and he didn't even, Sam didn't tell me and Peter didn't tell me he was going to do that. And it was just an amazing moment where, you know, we always say, as actors, like, oh, not everybody, but I always say, like, oh, I really want the moment to feel real, and, like, I'm so down for anything, like, anything you want to do, and then, like, when you got to... And then it and happens. And then it happens. <laughs> um, and you're not the one who planned it. It got and planned on you. Peter Sarsgaard is very... Yeah. But he's intense. Yeah, he's intense, but the thing you don't know about him is he's, like, he plays all these, like, like super evil, sinister... He's, like, the most loving human being. He's, like, the most loving, big-hearted person. How did the role of Jack Twist in Brokeback Mountain change from, or, did, or how did your approach to it, anyway, change from the moment you read the script until you finished filming? Whew. Um, uh, wow. I mean, when I read it, I just, I wasn't quite sure. You know, the casting process was a little weird, you know, Aang just brought me into a room. I sat down with A.V. Kaufman, the casting director, and Ang Lee, and I, and he just hardly said a thing. He just sat there, and I just said a couple things. He kind of nodded, smiled, and a sort of, and then sat there on more weird long beats with nothing much to say. And then he kind of patted my back and escorted me out, and I was like, oh, well. And then, like, three weeks later, I heard, like, he wanted to cast you in this part. You know, so I think he was looking for an essence of something, and in terms of do you mean, like, also how how it was responded to, or you mean just in terms of the process of doing the character? Just what did you learn about him? What a sad, broken-hearted fellow he, he was, you know? And you don't see that at first blush, no, right? Because no. he's the seducer, yeah. sort of, right? The more and aggressive guy. the more kind of guy. charismatic, kind of yeah. open, like, you know, having fun. You know, the guy who kind of knows the area and the land and has been there before and is not new to any of this. And I think he has... Uh, you know, it's always the ones who kind of, I think, sort of emote this positivity, I always say, you know, uh, particularly in the position that he's in. I was deeply sad after that, you know? I mean, I I think it was a it was a very interesting journey. We were super young. We had no idea what the movie was going to become, but that whole movie, you know, for all of us, it's a real, even amidst the beautiful love between Michelle and Heath and all things that, there was a real, um, there was a real sadness there, and particularly loneliness in that shooting where we were shooting, even with all the beauty around us. How did Heath's 
death affect you? Oh, I mean, I, I don't know if I can answer that in uh, one answer. Um, personally, it affected me in ways I can't really necessarily put into words or even would want to love to or want to talk about publicly. But in terms of professionally, I think, um, you know, I was at an age where like mortality was not always clear to me. Like, I don't think was that clear to me, you know? At an age when you have not lost a lot of friends. No. Right? No. And particularly because um, I think you you live in this bubble too of making films, you know? There's this like weird way people kind of, everybody kind of, uh, there are real friends and there is a real community but there all there also is that kind of you know there's that 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 Macklemore new album where he says like the curtain closes and nobody notices yeah. you know and i do think that that's i think that's true and i think that's okay you know but i think at the time i sort of assumed everyone would notice you know and they did with Heath dying but i think gave you the experience of what this is fleeting and um none of the sort of attention or or sort of synthesized like love that comes from the success of a film or that really matters at all you know what what matters is the relationships you make when you when you make a film and the people you learn from when you're preparing for a film and that changed a lot for me I am um, I'm gonna use the time we have left to um, I, you have worked th nearly three dozen movies you've made um, and I'm sorry. You have worked. <laughs> any, how many would you like to apologize for? That's that's a that's, that's the first question. I don't think too many. Um, <laughs> but the um, I, I mean, there's so. I mean, look, there's so many uh, from Nightcrawler and Day After Tomorrow. I mean, there are, there are movies of yours that I absolutely love. Um, but one thing that I've that is un, forget Kevin Bacon. You have worked with everybody, <laughs> right? <laughs> you make him look like an amateur. Wow, thanks, man. Um, so I'm going to ask you about people in in your people that you've worked with, people who you've crossed paths with, and you. I'd like you to tell me the first thing that comes to mind, whether it's Great. a okay. description of them yeah. or what you learned from them. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like a word, or it's like a, a long list. You can say as much as you want. But, okay. Um, but there are a lot of them, so okay. I ask you to be brief. <laughs> okay, no problem. <laughs> Your co-star in Love and Other Drugs and Brokeback Mountain and Hathaway. Like a massive talent and a really brilliant, kind of sometimes confusing human, you know? She's a, she's just like, she's one of the most adventurous people that I've ever met. She's this first person like you would never assume this of her. Like I, when I first met her, and even now, even knowing her for a long time, I would think, Anne is somebody who would just probably like not really want to get into the party. She is like the life of the party and the person who will jump off the cliff first. <laughs> like she really is. And I love contradictions in people. She happens to be that. And I think she's probably one of the most talented actors of our, actresses of our generation. Co-star and proof, Gwyneth Paltrow. Gwyneth. <laughs> she's a good friend and um, you know we we got to work together a little bit but I you know as a friend you know when we were working together we weren't that close it wasn't until after that we actually became really close and um, God I don't even know what to say what, what I we are two totally different actors that's what I would say um, uh, I think when we worked together, I kind of baffled her. You know, she was like, not in a good way. Um, I think she, I think she was just like, what is he do? Like, what is he doing? Like, she's very prepared and very planned, but I'm also like fly by the seat of my pants. And she's just like, you know, I think we learned to respect each other over time, but it was at first kind of, I think, a little awkward. Co-star in rendition and ex-girlfriend, Reese Witherspoon. Hmm. Um, I've never acted with her. I, I, you know, we've been in the same movie, but I've never acted with her. But uh, she is, as I would say about most of the women who I or are close friends or I've had relationships with in my life, s like one of the smartest, strongest people I've ever met. Co-star in Jarhead, Jamie Foxx. 
Jamie. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, be careful what you say. <laughs> no, uh, I, you know what? Like, I don't want to cross Jamie Foxx. When I hang out or I spend time with Jamie, I wish I had his spirit. That's how I feel. Wish I had his spirit. He is. I mean, talk about someone with no judgment. Like, he has no judgment. He is like, he is an artist. He has no. He's like, if I want to do this, I'm going to go do that. He is not uh, hindered by what he loves. Co-star in Donnie Darko, and your sister Maggie Gyllenhaal. Oh, seriously? <laughs> um, <clears throat> talentless. Um, um, Semi-intelligent, you know what I mean? Um, no, uh, my sister uh, is, you know, I, I, I've talked about my sister before, but I would say, like, I hope my sister knows uh, how pretty much I am forever the little brother, and I do what I do because I watched her do what she does so well, and I always thought to myself, I wanted to do it like her. The three-year age difference there? Yeah. Yeah. That's enough. Well, it's a Believe perfect me. age difference to look up to a sibling. <sighs> Particularly old a enough girl. If it's a girl, I think she's a lot. They're sort of older. older. Yeah. yeah. And uh, she's so damn good as an actor. Not as a sister so much. But. Director of the upcoming Nocturnal Animals, Tom Ford. Woo, Tom. <laughs> wow, you're hitting me, man. Um, I'm going to run out of compliment soon, so just, <laughs> just tell right. me who you're going to come up. Um, Tom. You know, Tom was a big surprise to me because I sort of knew him peripherally, um, but then working with him, I didn't realize really what a brilliant filmmaker he was. He wrote probably one of the best scripts I've ever read. A Nocturnal I, Animals. Yeah, I would say really on par with a script like Brokeback. Um, What's it about? Oof. Uh, it's a love story in a way, mm -hmm. but it's a love story about regret, really, and a story about... Um, uh, a writer who who delivers a book to his ex-wife who left him for another man and writes the book about the breakup and the book is pretty brutal she reads it and it's her journey through reading the book and uh, I play the main character in the book and the guy who wrote the book co-star in Zodiac Robert Downey Jr. Uh, I've said this about him before but I believe that he acts in the fourth dimension and for every 150 thoughts that any excellent actor has, he has 150,000 more. Co-star in Moonlight, Mile, Dustin Hoffman. For every 150 thoughts that Robert Downey <laughs> Jr. has, um, Dustin Hoffman has 150 million more. Co-star in Brothers, Natalie Portman. For every 150 thoughts <laughs> that Dustin Hoffman and Robert Downey Jr. think they have, they're probably every other thought thinking about Natalie Portman. <laughs> <laughs> She's, uh, again, um, I mean, I have had the honor of being raised by some of the smartest, strongest women I've ever met, um, and uh, having worked with some of the same in my business. Um, so, yeah, I mean, she's just, uh, Natalie's one of a kind. You know that. You know that. I don't have to say that. Co-star in Brothers, Tobey Maguire. Um, we look like. Uh, it was my suggestion that we play brothers. Really? Yeah. And that was after the whole Spider-Man thing. Oh man! When during that time, so many times I get in a taxi cab and because they City kept and, they kept threatening him that they were going to fire him and hire you to play Spider-Man. Right. Yes. Before but you did Brothers. Together. Be even before that. When I would walk down the street, people would be like, I love you in Spider-Man, you know? Um, so at a certain point, I just like, I accepted it, you know? And I was like, I remember there was a woman on a plane who came up to me and she said, she was walking by, she said, can I tell my grandchildren I was on a plane with Spider-Man? And I said, yes, you can. Yes. <laughs> Go right ahead. Go ahead. Um, They're not so, going to know. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I mean, um, yeah, I mean, I, he is like my... You know, he is one of also, well, the thing that you don't know about Toby is that he is a, a, a fantastic uh, producer and he is uh, so smart and has been, of all the actors that I've worked with, has been so supportive of me in my career. You know, um, he's come to every show I've done in theater. Uh, he always writes me about the work that I've done. Um, he is, uh, 
a really loving guy and uh and it was it was so interesting again you're making brothers with Natalie Portman and Tobey Maguire and Jim Sheridan you know you just you know sometimes I want to go up there and slap that guy who you know was making that movie because sometimes I wasn't so aware of the incredible people that I was working with Jerry Bruckheimer producer of Prince of Persia you're picking a lot of really sweet people well, I, like, well, I can show you the list. By the way, the, the list goes on and on. We Jesus. won't get to everybody. Do you want me to show you the jerks? He is the only, <laughs> he is the only one who has a name as long as my last name. <laughs> <laughs> um, he's, uh, I saw him just the other night and knows everything that I've done and that I'm doing. Um, constantly checks in on me. And uh, he and his wife, Linda, are two like some of the most lovely people I've met in this business. And a hockey player. Yes, well that I've heard, yeah. I've never been to his hockey rink, I've heard a lot about, but yes, a hockey player. When I see him, I feel like I need to talk about hockey because he's really interested in hockey. He also has that sort of <laughs> wonderful, awkward sort of exchange. <laughs> it's always awkward with Jerry, but it's always super awkward with Aang. There are some brilliant people in this world that are, you know, the, the biggest hearts and Clearly, they express themselves in other ways. Their way of communicating, they've chosen in, in, the, in regard to like Aang or, or, or Jerry, you know, the, through the medium of movies, you know. And it's also both, it's really interesting, they're both very comfortable with silence. That's true. They're, they're not, they're not going to fill the air. It's so if true. If you it's so, it's so true. There have been a number of times where I've sat with both just sort of an Uh-huh. But, a real, but there's such a sweetness that you're sort of almost comfortable in it too, although it's against everything I believe and when, I'm able to <laughs> When you know endure. them, yes. yes. Isabella Rossellini, co-star and Enemy. Oh, man. Um, well, she came in and worked for two days. We were graced by her brilliance for two days. Um, she's absolutely incredible I, I hardly really know her um, I couldn't believe that she wanted to be in that movie um, in enemy the movie that she she did she played my mother and uh, it was just like she's just walking around with history you know yeah co-star on the good girl which is maybe one of my favorite <laughs> movies that you've ever done Jennifer Aniston she's um She's a rough one, I, you know, not likable, so hard <laughs> to compliment. Uh, I will say, uh, have had had a crush on her for years, and working with her uh, was not easy. You know, she was. It was. Uh, I was. Um, I uh, yeah. That's all I'm gonna say. It was. Uh, it was. Lovely. I, 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 you know, it wasn't hard. That's what I would say. Did you grow up watching Friends? Is that is that where the the crush developed? Like everybody? Not so much Friends, but like kind of just her personality from afar and the movies that she was in, and then some of Friends, but not like a huge Friends fan. Yeah, but just who she is. You know what's so great, honestly, about you? When I the um, besides always just being nice to work with from my from my end of from things, your and you're always things, a gentleman yeah. to, you know, whenever I've sent somebody, and you're just great. But you also come up and say thank you. I'm sure if it, I'm sure if you didn't think it was nice or something, but you like, you're, you are very collaborative with people that you, that you work with. And that's great. And I was really impressed thanks. when you just saw me and said thanks for being, I don't even know what it was about, but well, very few people do that. But I would say like, I, it's funny, there's this thing that happens, um, because everybody's like so precious around actors, you know, in a weird way. Not a lot of people, but like on, in the business of making movies. And I, I also, I came to this, I had this weird epiphany on a movie once where I had all these departments surrounding me and like putting on a wardrobe, fixing wardrobe, putting on a microphone and someone touching your hair and someone put, you know, and then the director would talk to you and like, and um, I thought, I carry basically every department on me. That's what I do. That's my job. My job is to carry every department on me. And I think you can really misinterpret that and be like, oh, I'm here because, like, you know, what I do is so important. I'm here to be serviced. Right. Right. And, like, this microphone here is, it's here because, like, what I'm saying, no, they don't, no one cares what I have to say. They're just, this is somebody's <laughs> so job, and I'm care. carrying the <laughs> department on me. And I just, I, and I need to make sure that that's, this is clear and the sound is clear. Cause, and, and, you know, I, I think that's like that's the best part about making a movie is what I find weird is there's no there's no acting department there's just like 
this like weird group of people we call actors and then there's every other department and i uh i'm i am grateful like i i i know that that sounds uh um i don't know cheesy or i i it doesn't sound cheesy well it's given great. You know, i am grateful and right? i am grateful lot, that lots of people aren't grateful <laughs> like in life in general maybe because it's and i'll talk the about secret to happiness well talk about mark ruffalo cuz he's not disposable um he said to me once when we were shooting this movie zodiac i remember him saying i was like 25 at the time and there was in the midst of all this you know um attention around brokeback mountain all this stuff and we were filming the movie and stuff and he and he said uh i remember him saying to me he's kind of tough with me and he said uh just wait you know There'll be times where things won't go that way. You'll appreciate, you'll appreciate things that you had in this moment. And I was like, <laughs> whatever, <laughs> you know, like <laughs> whatever. You. Yeah, like, um, and uh, it's true. And um, I'm just, I just feel grateful that I can, I'm still doing it, and that when, whenever I talk or whatever, um, and particularly someone like you. I mean, you're great at your job. You're fun. You're tough. You're, yeah, you know, not that tough. yeah, but no, but you are. <laughs> I feel like these were really tough questions. No, not the questions. I mean, <laughs> questions were super not tough. But, but I, but, and I respect that. I respect that. So, thank you for having me.